I'm not gonna say that they single-handedly popularized the spooky gothic version of punk and hardcore because there's lots of other people like My Chemical Romance and Bam Margera that certainly played a big role in making Nightmare Before Christmas, Eyeliner, and Dramatic Scarves popular with dudes who listen to edgy alternative music in the 2000s, but I would say that AFI were among the first and most important. What's up, everybody? I am Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA. And in case you haven't noticed, my background has changed yet again. This is because we're still in the middle of moving. So if you will excuse me, I'm recording this from the spare bedroom at my mother-in-law's house. But more importantly, today we are here to talk about AFI because they're really, truly a special band. One that really stands out in the history of rock, which is full of artists who shot themselves in the foot by making all kinds of big stylistic changes and alienating half their fan base in the process. For example, Metallica doing it with Load and Saint Anger, Linkin Park with One More Night, Fall Out Boy with God Save Rock and Roll as just a few of the many, many examples of this happening. And I get it because fans, for the most part, just kind of want you to stick to one thing. Like nobody is asking Hatebreed to go make a ska album, right? Which is why I'm so fascinated by the few artists who are able to make these kind of drastic style changes and actually pull it off. And there's probably no better example of that than AFI. I remember when they came out as a skate punk band, then transformed over the years into everything from like a straight edge hardcore band to horror punk in that era where Davey had Karen hair and fishnet shirts, which happens to be my favorite era of AFI actually, to the Joy Division style gothic post-punk that they're doing now. And what's truly amazing to me is that even with all those wild stylistic changes, they pulled it off every single time. And I know there's already some people disagreeing with me there because I know there's various factions of the AFI fandom that have very strong feelings about this. There's probably people who have gotten in like physical fights or over which era of AFI is the best? If you were hospitalized in a street fight, outside chain reaction, defending answer this and stay fashionable, you may be entitled to financial compensation. But hear me out, because although I personally have never been the biggest fan of their music, I've always admired the band a lot. Because I would say there's probably no band that's pulled off more stylistic changes than AFI without really ever falling off. They've just gotten bigger and bigger and more and more influential every step of the way. And on a personal note, for me as somebody whose roots are primarily in the hardcore scene, I would say that AFI probably did more to popularize hardcore than any other band. So the question is, how did they do it? What is the secret to their success? And also, what is AFI's legacy at this point? Those are the questions that I will try to answer in this video. But first, I wanted to mention that I am now on Twitch. I'm streaming twice a week now on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I've also got a Discord now that's up to almost 4,000 people. So check out both of those at the link in the description. And let's get into it. AFI first came onto my radar in my senior year of high school, which was 1996. My friend Corey was really into all that Fat Records, Epitaph, skate punk type stuff and he told me about this band called AFI that he heard on the new Nitro Records sampler. By the way, shout out to those 90s CD samplers. I heard so many great bands that way. I checked them out and they were good, but you know, they didn't really seem like anything terribly different from like your typical Nitro Records band. Definitely better than average, but back then none of us could have possibly predicted that they would become this legendary, massively influential game-changing band. But with that said, even back then at the very beginning of the band, I noticed that they started evolving almost immediately. The first transition that I saw them make was to kind of lean more into the hardcore scene than the skate punk scene. I saw them in, I think, 1997 with Sick of It All and Strife, and I was kind of surprised that they just totally fit right in because, like I said, I knew them as a skate punk band. I thought of them as being kind of part of the same scene as like Lagwagon and Guttermouth. And if you weren't super into the scene back then, then that may not seem like a big difference. It may seem like I'm just splitting hairs, but to me, it was a big difference because those scenes really were worlds apart. The hardcore scene was, you know, what you would guess from the name, a lot more violent and aggressive. The music was way more more metal and the people were a lot more violent and aggressive especially compared to the 90s skate punk scene which was relatively like pg-13 pretty safe accessible stuff so although from what I've seen, people mostly tend to group the first three AFI albums together as kind of part of their punk phase or whatever, to me, they were already into the second incarnation of AFI by the time they put out Shut Your Mouth and Open Your Eyes. Even that early in the band's history, they'd already transitioned from this pretty fun, goofy, lighthearted skate punk band to a much more serious, aggressive, melodic hardcore band. 
And it's also when you got to see how much Davey and his personal style was kind of tied into all this. This is when you saw him really kind of lean into like the straight edge hardcore look a lot more. As kind of an early example of how much his aesthetic and personal style has always been kind of an indicator of where the band's head was at creatively. Like I remember seeing him wear a lot of hardcore merch back then and being kind of surprised by it. Like, oh, look at that. He's wearing a new age record shirt. He must know what's up. Which again, might not seem like that big of a deal, especially these days. But the only other band that I can think of that really was able to pull off that crossover between skate punk and hardcore was Good Riddance. One band out of the like nine bajillion skate punk bands of the late 90s. And so that kind of tells you a lot about what they had pulled off. For a band to come from the skate punk scene and become accepted by the hardcore scene and taken seriously, there was not easy. So they were already showing this very rare ability to be kind of musical chameleons. Which brings us to the next transition that they made, what I would call like their horror punk era. Obviously, the All Hallows Eve was the defining release of this period, but I think it really started around Black Sails in 1999. They started to kind of sound a little bit more like an updated version of the Misfits. Davey grew a devil lock, and he traded in his refused shirt for Sisters of Mercy merch. And of course, that peaked with the All Hallows Eve EP, which really went all in on the like Misfits, Danzig, Sam Hain kind of influences. Well, I And again, this might not seem like a big deal now. This might not seem like very impressive or adventurous by today's standards. But in 1999, that was not an obvious or predictable thing to do at all. It's not like the Misfits were some sort of unknown, obscure band that people didn't like or anything like that, but they certainly weren't as universally loved as they are now. That aesthetic was definitely not as popular as it is now. And I would actually go as far as to say that part of the reason they are so relevant now is because of what AFI did around this period to make that that stuff relevant again. Which brings us to what I think of as the definitive pivot in AFI's career and the most interesting part of the band to me personally, what I would call their goth phase. To me, this started with Sing the Sorrow in 2003, which was their first major label release. And clearly the label was betting a lot on this one. They saw something in this band. I don't know how much it cost to record this thing, but it was not cheap. It was produced by Butch Vig, who's best known for producing Nevermind for Nirvana, as well as tons of other stuff. And also Jerry Finn, who's best known for producing Enema of the State by Blink-182. So for whatever reason, they saw this band doing stuff in the underground and they decided to put them with the A-team and invest a lot of money in this band and it paid off. It was kind of like a perfect storm. And to me, this is the moment where they went from being a very good, like above average punk band to being a truly great, iconic rock band. And like I said earlier, I'm not actually even a huge fan of the band and I don't really personally like this album, but still I have a ton of respect for what they did with it. To me, this album was like the ultimate realization of what bands like Christian Death and Sam Hain started out doing in the 80s, but executed way better and just taken to a whole other level that honestly, I don't think anybody ever dreamed was possible. It had all the darkness and that angsty goth vibe of those bands, but with much more polished production, songwriting, and just overall craft. Like I said, I'm not even really a fan personally, but objectively speaking, I would call this album a masterpiece. You can listen to it now, and to me, it stands up just as well as it did back then, if not more so. Because in hindsight, we know how groundbreaking and influential it was. You could really go break this album down song by song, but to me, Death of Seasons stands out as maybe the best example of what they were going for here. And just the breadth of influences that they brought together. It goes between that misfit style upbeat punk to that little industrial part in the bridge that comes and goes really quickly, but still adds a lot to the song. To the outro that's kind of like a melodic hardcore thing that sounds surprisingly modern to me, almost like Touche Amore or something. And then ends on this string section with Davey screaming in the background. They did so many things in just this one song, and yet it all kind of works together as this one cohesive concept. And to me, that's the story of this album, which is what cemented their status as a legit mainstream rock band. 
It went to number five on Billboard and was later certified as platinum. And I remember a lot of the people I knew who loved AFI as a punk band were not into this. They were kind of disappointed by this album. And honestly, I do understand why. As great as it is, it's not a punk album. It's more of like a dark alternative rock album. So I understand why maybe some part of their core fan base was turned off. But for every fan that they lost, I think they gained 10 or 100 more. And this album has definitely stood the test of time. And so with that, they pulled off what really only a handful of other bands have ever been able to do. To go from the D. DIY punk scene, playing at venues like Chain Reaction and Gilman and Ground Zero up here in Bellevue, to the top of the mainstream charts without ever leaving their roots behind. And if this was the peak of their career, like if everything else they put after this was dog shit and they fell off, I would still say that they deserve to be considered all-time greats, but this was not even it. They just kept going with this and continued in this direction with their next album, December Underground, which is my personal favorite AFI album by a mile. Although I do recognize that the reasons I love it are why a lot of other people hate it. It's probably overall their most catchy, upbeat album since Answer That and Stay Fashionable, but unlike that album, which is kind of like a goofy punk album, this is a lot more dark and sophisticated and polished in pretty much every way, which is pretty impressive considering that it only came out 10 years later. One thing that they introduced here, which I personally really liked, is the electronic and post-punk elements that they kind of brought in. For example, like in the song 37 Millimeter. <laughs> Which is interesting to me because normally I hate post-punk in any way, shape, or form. Like the slightest hint of Joy Division just makes me want to like vomit and run out of the room. But there's just something about the way that they did it on this album that made it work for me. I really can't explain why, but it just sounds good to me. And this album went to number one on Billboard, which shocked me then and shocks me even more now. Because to me, I think of this as just a straight up pure post-hardcore album. Probably the best post-hardcore album of all time. Like... Listen to the song Kill Caustic. To me, that's just like a better, more polished version of Refused. And I would imagine that Davey and the band would agree with me on that. I'm sure that's not an accident. And again, with these two albums, they pulled off another huge stylistic shift. It still sounds like AFI because it's still the same core lineup and it's still Davey's voice. But if you played 37 millimeter for me in 1997 and you told me it was the same band that I just saw with Strife, I would have said you were crazy. And whether you like it or not is up to you. I know that this era of the band can be a little bit divisive, but either way, I think you have to respect the shit out of what they did with this album. This was the biggest shift yet of their career. Pretty much sounds like a completely different band than they did in the 90s. And yet it was their most successful album and still Still, even with all those stylistic changes, even with going more pop in a lot of ways, they still never walked away from their roots. In fact, I think you could make the argument that with these two albums, AFI did more to put hardcore in the mainstream than anybody else before or since. They went to number one with an album whose lead single, Miss Murder, leads up to the climax of the song, which is Davey just letting out this straight up hardcore scream. <laughs> They took bands like Bleeding Through out at the same time that they were at the top of the charts, which obviously they didn't have to do and was probably not a smart thing to do from like a commercial perspective. And if you don't believe me, if I had to point to just one thing to really underscore what I'm talking about here, look at the video for Leaving Song Part 2, which is probably the most legit example of hardcore ever seen on this kind of like mainstream stage. And if you ever wondered how this came together, like where did they get these straight edge guys moshing? I did a little bit of digging, asked a couple of my friends who were in the video, and they told me all about it. This first one here is from my friend Biggie. He used to manage bands like Every Time I Die, Between the Buried Me, and The Story So Far, among many others. What a funny memory. I was literally put in charge of assembling the SoCal moshers. I had all my friends and their friends come out. Josh Highland pretty much nailed it. I had all the OC dudes and the Donnybrook LA crew, etc. It was legit sketchy. 
see. They played Hate Breed over the PA and multiple people got injured. I also asked Josh Highland of Death Star, the awesome Christian Moshcore band. He's the guy Xing up at the beginning, and here's what he said. It was honestly the most violent thing I've ever been involved with, which is saying a lot coming from a guy who was that involved with like the Inland Empire hardcore scene in the 2000s. The medic was working overtime, several broken noses, Mitch Lucker got knocked out, many black eyes, a kid left in an ambulance for broken ribs, which again is pretty amazing. They didn't need to do any of that because 99.9% .9 of their audience had no clue what they were watching and wouldn't have known the difference between legit hardcore dudes and just actors paid to look like it. But they did the video the right way anyway because for all their success and as easy as it would have been to just walk away from the scene completely, at the end of the day, they were still hardcore dudes who wanted to give a little nod to the scene. And they did. It's a little bit out of sequence here, but on the topic of hardcore, I also have to give a shout out to Davey and Jade's side project, Extremist, which if you haven't heard it, is pretty great. Kind of sounds like a cross between Dillinger Escape Plan and AFI. And also features Josh from Stick Your Guns on guitar. And on drums, it has Val from Loma Prieto and Punch. And what's also cool to me is that it came out on Steve Aoki's label, Dim Mock, which may seem weird to some people, but as a lot of you probably know, Steve was also a legit 90s hardcore kid, so it actually makes complete sense. And I just think it's super cool whenever there's examples of people like this that have attained like super huge mainstream stardom, but still just take a little bit of time to give a little nod to the hardcore scene like this. Davey's also been vegan and straight edge forever, talked about it in tons of interviews. And so with all the mainstream exposure they got, sometimes in really kind of odd places like the soundtrack for Madden 2004, which is the least AFI thing I could think of. But you think about that with the millions and millions of eyeballs that they had on the band and their music, how many kids saw that stuff? And that was their introduction to the world of hardcore. But anyway, getting back to their evolution, their next album, Crash Love, in 2009, pretty much picked up where December Underground left off. I would say it's my second favorite AFI album. I'm kind of put it into this phase of the band. Which brings us to the last evolution of AFI, what I think of as their post-punk era, which started with Burials in 2013 and reached its peak on their most album that came out this year, 2021. tell from listening to that they really went in on the influences from 80s post-punk bands like joy division new order and gang of four and like i mentioned before i absolutely cannot stand post-punk it's one of my least favorite genres of music so this stuff isn't for me but even so i can respect that as always they do it really well from what i can see their core fan base generally isn't that stoked on this era of the band but they do continue to crush it on a commercial level burials and the blood album the self-titled one both made the billboard top 10. So I think no matter how you feel about it, you have to look at these albums as both big successes. And so if you just kind of zoom out and look back at their career, you see that they've done everything from skate punk to death rock to whatever you want to call December Underground to post punk. And they've got their hardcore side projects and black audio. And at least in my opinion, they have never put out a bad album. Everything they do is executed at such a high level. And I just can't say enough about how much I admire that because it's hard enough to do even one style well. So the fact that AFI has done four or five different styles so well, plus a few more with their side projects like Extremist and Black Audio is just incredible. These guys just do not miss. And I honestly cannot think of another band who has done so much and done it so well and been so influential other than, I guess, maybe Bring Me the Horizon. But as great as they are, they've still got quite a ways to go before they can be talked about in the same sentence as AFI in terms of influence, impact, and legacy. And speaking of which, let's talk about what their legacy is. I'm not going to say that they single-handedly popularized the spooky, gothic version of punk and hardcore because there's lots of other people like My Chemical Romance and Bam Margera that certainly played a big role in making Nightmare Before Christmas, Eyeliner, and Dramatic Scarves popular with dudes who listen to edgy alternative music in the 2000s. So they may not have been the only ones, but I would say that AFI were among the first and most important. And to anybody who's watching who's a little bit younger, that may not seem like such a big deal to you because you've never known any different. You have only known the world in which it's cool to wear eyeliner when you're in a hardcore band. But it wasn't always that way, and I would say that the gothification of the alternative scene is one of the biggest cultural shifts in the scene that I can remember. 
Back in the 90s, it was definitely not cool for like punk or hardcore dudes to wear eyeliner, have a devil lock and listen to Joy Division. That would be considered gay. But now it's a different world. That's not just acceptable, it's cool. And you have to give it to AFI for being a big part of making that transition happen. And that's true on a musical level too. They were the gateway band for millions and millions of kids who got into alternative music via AFI back in the 2000s. And then maybe looked into AFI's earlier albums and who their influences were. And that's how they got into goth, industrial, death rock, post-punk, hardcore, and all kinds of other more obscure music because, you know, AFI was really drawing from everything. That's part of what made the band so special and part of what made them such a great gateway band that could kind of act as like a sorting hat for kids to find the sub sub genre that felt like home to them. And it was just cool to see. They were a band that I saw go from playing random shows at Gilman to hitting number one on the Billboard charts with a straight up post hardcore album full of screaming. I mean, that was a huge moment for the scene. And again, for me personally, as somebody whose roots are primarily in, I guess you would say the vegan straight edge hardcore scene of the 90s, I really appreciate how much they did to put that scene on the mainstream platform. You gotta give it up to Fall Out Boy for doing some of that as well with Andy and Pete being involved with Race Trade and sect and vegan Reich and stuff, but I think nobody did it more than AFI. And also for whatever it's worth, they just seem like great guys. I don't know them personally, but we have a lot of mutual friends. And in a scene that loves to talk shit, in all these years, I've never heard a single bad thing about anybody in AFI. And I think that tells you a lot. But more than anything, to me, the defining thing about AFI is that they're a band that's reinvented itself around half a dozen times over the past 25 years or so without ever fucking it up. I honestly can't think of anybody else who has pulled that off. And for that alone, they have my respect. And as for the future, I'll be interested to see where this goes. On the one hand, I could see them breaking up tomorrow, just being like, you know what? We've said everything we have to say, peace out. We want to quit on top, which would be totally respectable. Or on the other hand, I could see them sticking around for another 25 years because they've just got that much more to say. And if they do, I wouldn't be surprised to see them change another half dozen times along the way and again, pull it off every single time. All right, my friends, that does it for this video about AFI. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Check me out on Twitch if you haven't. I'm streaming on Tuesdays and Thursdays now. I may add some more days in the future, but that's what I'm doing for now. Join the Discord if you haven't. Again, we're up to almost 4,000 people. I'm in there all the time. It's a lot of fun. There's links to both of those things in the description. And as always, I wanna thank everyone who supports us on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. It is because of your support that we're able to do a lot of things. That's how I pay our podcast producer and editor, for example. Patrons get access to every podcast a week early. There's members-only channels in the Discord that I'm in all the time. I do Q&As. I do some giveaways. There's also a way to have me review your music or artwork or anything else you want to get my eyes and ears on. So if that sounds cool to you, you can check out the Patreon at the link in the description below. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.